So here we have a case of a middle-aged woman, 48 years old, diagnosed with chronic phase CML. Her case was fairly typical in that she did have some splenomegaly. Her blood counts were quite abnormal with a markedly elevated white blood cell count, some anemia, mild change in her platelet counts, although still in the normal range. There were 6% blasts in the blood, which is notable. Typical cytogenetics um, were, showed 100% uh, pH positivity, and molecular studies were consistent with the B3 perfusion at a level above 100% on the international scale. So she represents the dilemma of how to treat a newly diagnosed CML patient, which medications do we choose and, and how do we navigate. Um, she was started on desantinib therapy, 100 milligrams per day, after d discussion of uh, multiple choices. And she actually did well. She had, within six months, a major molecular response, and then within a year, a deeper molecular remission, and continued along that path for several years. When we think about a patient who newly diagnosed with CML, we probably ought to take a step back and do what's called a risk stratification or risk assessment. Traditionally, that is looking at the disease parameters. And ironically, a bone marrow study isn't necessary, at least looking at historic risk stratification, to do that. The blood counts, the physical exam findings, the patient's age, all can be put into different models. These models have evolved, the original being the so-called score, but with time, the Hasford, the Euro score, um, um, and, and even um, scores that incorporate survival have been developed, which um, I really helped us project how what a patient will do and then perhaps how to choose therapy. There are some thoughts in different guidelines whether a high-risk patient should have different therapy than a low-risk patient, although I think there's debate over that. But, but that um, is sort of one part of the risk assessment. I think the other is to look at the patient as a whole, look at their medical status, their comorbid illnesses. That's become increasingly important as we choose therapy and navigate patients uh, on therapy, looking at toxicity and risk benefits of different changes in therapy or even initial choices. So we have three approved agents um, for the frontline setting. We may have more as time passes, but uh, in a higher risk patient of younger age, I think it's very reasonable to pursue a second generation uh, B3-able tyrosine kinase inhibitor like desantinib. Um, and that's what was chosen in this patient, which I think is, is uh, very practical. And um, in turn, the patient did well. Um, the, um, you know, the important milestones um, in, uh, are noted in the case, and I think that's the next step after risk stratification, decision making, and initial therapies, of course, to make sure the patient um, moves along their treatment journey you know, promptly and meets appropriate milestones. So in digging a little bit deeper into this case, um, there were you know, multiple different choices for her, and one could consider imantinib, galantinib, or desantinib uh, uh, currently for a newly diagnosed CML patient. I think, again, her risk stratification put her in a higher risk category. If you calculate her risk by historic models, like the so-called risk, she calculates as a higher risk patient. The things that probably make that true are the increase in blasts in the blood, the enlargement in the spleen, and perhaps a bit her younger age. So. Um, I think imantinib offers a good uh, response in a patient like this. Um, there are differences in high risk versus intermediate or lower risk patients from our um, original data from the IRISH trial. And if we look at data from our second generation trials used in the frontline setting, comparative trials, the Inest ND trial and the Decision trial, there were advantages across the board, but they may be slightly greater advantages for patients with higher risk disease. Um, we didn't hear much about her comorbid illness status. I think that would have been an important um, uh, line of questioning. Uh, does, does she have cardiovascular disease? Does she have cardiopulmonary disease, diabetes? Um, any health conditions that you know, require careful attention that potentially could be exacerbated by uh, a treatment choice. Um, assuming those weren't the case, I think um, in, in, in the end, desantinib um, for a younger patient with high risk disease represents a good choice and is expected to you know, bring a patient into rapid um, molecular response, something called early molecular response, within three to six months, and then hopefully prompt cytogenetic response within 12 to 18 months, and deeper molecular response within generally 18 months or beyond. And as we see, this patient actually responded quite quickly with major molecular response within the first year and a deeper molecular response as the months continued.